Good evening. Again, it is good to see each and every one of you here, and what a blessing it is that we may gather together and study God's Word and sing such wonderful songs of praise to Him. It's good to see uh, Paul feeling a little bit better and able to lead us in songs once again. As we come together tonight, we are going to be looking at that which we've been examining here on Sunday evenings, and that is looking at the characteristics by which God describes himself or has those who are inspired to describe him uh, throughout the Old Testament in particular. Up to this point, we have looked at three Hebrew names for God or characteristics for God. We looked at that which we find there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the very beginning there where God is mentioned, the word Elohim, where we talked about and examined how that word is like the Greek word Godhead. It is one God being manifested or talked and explained through the deities of three, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We then also talked about El Elyon, God Most High, and how he is truly such. And last week we looked at El Shaddai, God Almighty. Today we will be examining El Olam. And this first is found there in Genesis 21 and verse 33. This El Olam means God everlasting. There in Genesis chapter 21, verse 23, we read this. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. When we think of this particular combination or name for God, it is one of the ones that's slightly different than those in which we've examined up to this point. Up to this point, there's been a number of, of passages wherein we see the combination of El, uh, whether it's El uh, Elohim or El Shaddai, or whatever the case may be, uh, we see that in many places in the scriptures, sometimes over 2,000 times. In this particular case, this is the only place where we see El uh, Olam there in the Old Testament where it is God everlasting, or if your translation has everlasting God, like the ESV says. When we think about this, though, and look at this, that second word in this, that is everlasting, O-L-A-M, there in the Hebrew, Olam, when we look at that in its totality, we do find a few other places in Scripture where it is attributed to God. And so it's with that in mind, we're going to examine in our lesson today how we see God everlasting in our lives and in the scriptures. When we examine the scriptures, we find, for example, in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 4, where God is described as an everlasting rock. There's our word there for olam, everlasting, and everlasting rock. Now, you and I have heard and know the word rock has been used as a metaphor for a long time. We've heard things like, listen, so-and-so is my rock. Typically, married couples will say, uh, listen, my wife or my husband, they are my rock. And that term has been around for a long time. The idea behind it and the structure and reason and all those things, we've seen it, uh, we've used it, and we've been around it. Biblically speaking, God has used that same term, rock, to describe himself. And in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 4, we read this. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Brothers and sisters, our God is an everlasting rock. But why would God describe himself in this way? Why would everlasting God use the term everlasting rock to describe himself and use that term that is his characteristic in line with rock? There's three reasons I want us to consider for that first because he is everlasting strength. 
When you think of a rock, and not a pebble, but a rock, there's strength behind it, isn't there? I remember one time uh, visiting my, my grandparents there on the farm. And uh, we, as the custom was, we would get there and, and we would always, as city boys, not only help with the garden and things of that nature, but we would always dig a big hole. And there was land, and so, listen, at mom and dad's, if you dug a hole, that wasn't good. You got a whooping for that because you messed up the grass, you messed up all that. But out there, Nana Bob, listen, if you go to such and such place, you can dig a hole. Later on, we joked around and said we could have dug the well he dug later if he had just not made us fill it in every year. But nevertheless, we would dig that hole. And from time to time, we would come across different rocks. And it was amazing at how strong these rocks were. Now, some weren't real big and some weren't uh, real strong. But every now and then, you got the one, a hammer, a chisel, everything we would try to get it out of there so we could continue digging. It was just tough. It would take us sometimes a week. I remember one of them was so large and so big. I don't know why we spent the time doing it, but nevertheless, we did. There was strength in that rock. Our everlasting God is an everlasting rock. He is everlasting strength. In Psalm 18, 1 through 3, we read this. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I am saved from my enemies. The psalmist here said, listen, I know who my everlasting rock is. I know who my strength is found in. I know who is strong and mighty on my side. God as Everlasting God and everlasting rock is everlasting strength. He is that power and might we can rely on. A little later in Psalm 31 and verse 3, we read this. For you are my rock and my <laughs> fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. When we think of God as an everlasting rock, he is that everlasting strength in our lives. We also see, though, that he is not only our everlasting strength, he is eternal or everlasting rock because he is everlasting assurance, isn't he? In Psalm 71 and verse 3, we read this, be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. The psalmist says here, listen, I know you are my rock. I know I can continually rely on you. I can come to you over and over and over. I know that you will be my refuge. I know you'll be my strength. I know you'll be what I need. I can assuredly rely on the assurance of God that his assurance is everlasting. The everlasting rock of God everlasting is not only in his everlasting strength, but in his everlasting assurance. We can be assured and have assurance in him that he is there for us and that we may continually be able to come to him. Thirdly, and why would God call himself a rock, an everlasting rock? There in Isaiah 26, we see that not only is it because of his everlasting strength as a rock is strong or his everlasting Assurance is a, a rock is surely going to be there. It's not moving, but also in his everlasting, immovable salvation. I don't remember where I quite heard this, but and I don't even remember the context, but it was being talked about in the context of moving a mountain. And someone said, well, I feel like I've only moved the mountain an inch. And someone said, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Sometimes those boulders, those rocks, they seem immovable. Our God, our everlasting rock, is immovable in his desire and want for our salvation. In 2 Samuel 22 and verse 47, we read this, The Lord lives, 
and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. When we think of El Olam, everlasting God, what we are seeing, what we are recognizing, what God is describing in himself and is being described of him is that he is there. He is one who empowers and embodies great strength. He is one we can place our assurances in because his assurance is everlasting and he is immovable in his love for us and wanting us to be with him forever in salvation, wanting us to be saved and with him. He is our everlasting rock. El Olam. The everlasting God of heaven is you and mine, you and I. It's our everlasting rock because of his unwavering strength, assurance, and salvation. Now, these three truths also make something else clear. When we look at Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10, our next text, we see that these three things make it clear that, listen, our God is an everlasting king. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10, we read this, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. When we think of who El Olam or everlasting God is, he is not only an everlasting rock, but he is the everlasting King of each and every one of us. As everlasting king, our God is, notice, king of kings. And this is because there is no greater than he. I came across uh, a statement made by Adam Clark. And he was talking about, in particular, uh, Jeremiah 10 and verse 10, and he made a statement concerning this idea of everlasting king. What that represents as king of kings. He had this to say, and I love how he succinctly put it, as he is made, so he governs all things. His sway is felt both in the heavens and in the earth. In other words, God has the right as king of kings to govern men as he chooses because he is everlasting king. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21, we see this illustrated, don't we? He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge, and knowledge excuse me, to those who have understanding. As king, as everlasting king, he is king of kings. There are no kings greater than he. Romans 13, 1, Paul describes it this way. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. He is king of kings. He is everlasting king. However, the everlasting king isn't just king over kings, is he, as we know. As we know the passage, he is king over us. That's not just the leaders and rulers of the world. No, he's king over you and I. In Psalm 47 and verse 7, the psalmist beautifully describes our God as the king of all the earth. He sings with a song. When we look at this and we see that God is king of everyone. Again, Paul in 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 would describe God as king of kings when he said, which he will display at the proper time. He was blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in an approachable life, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal or everlasting dominion. Amen. The God whom you and I are serving tonight, who we are serving today and worshiping, our God is everlasting. And he is not only an everlasting rock, he is an everlasting king. And that means he is king of kings. He is king over all of us. 
And as seen here, he's not only king of kings, is he? But he's also Lord of lords. The word Lord just simply means master or ruler. Oftentimes we see, uh, especially back in uh, biblical times, uh, this was a recognition of just simple authority. For example, remember Sarah called Abraham Lord. She wasn't saying deity. She was saying, listen, you are the one who has authority in the home. When we look at God everlasting, he not only <laughs> is king of kings and king over all, he is master or ruler over everyone as well. In 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11 and 12, we read this. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. He who has authority over all of us, who is ruler, who is master, when we think of our everlasting God, he is everlasting king, and therefore everlasting master. Exodus, in Exodus 15, 19, we read this, For when horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. He is authority over all of it, over everything. In John 1, 49 of Jesus, God the Son, we read this, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. In the great book of Revelation, we see that term King of Kings and Lord of Lords again. Don't we apply it to the Son this time? Wherein he is leading his army, the Lord's army. It says on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When we think about our everlasting King, El Olam is truly an everlasting rock and our everlasting king. With El Olam being our everlasting rock and king, it is, it is fitting then, excuse me, that he is recognized as eternal, which brings us to our third and final point. The idea of eternity is hard to grasp. We've talked about this before. Listen, I can think forward quite well. Backwards to eternity, that's another thing altogether. And even looking forward is hard to understand. I've heard and used the illustration, you know, the guy who put a string across the room and he put a, a little BB on that string and he said, that's just a blip in eternity and, and so is the string, to be honest. When we think of the reality of eternity and what it is, it's hard to understand. It's hard to grasp. And there's a reason for some of that. Listen, as Deuteronomy 29, 29 points it out, the secret things belong to the Lord. There are things that we won't be able to understand here on earth. There are things that are going to be hard that haven't been revealed. Now, he has, though, revealed those things we are to look to. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. In other words, God wants us to go to his word and examine those things he has given us when it comes to eternity. Though it's hard to grasp, the Bible is clear. There are aspects of it we need to understand concerning our God everlasting or God eternal. As everlasting God, who is eternal? What does this mean? Well, it means he is always, notice this, past, present, and future. Again, I don't claim to know how this is fully done, but I know it's right. God is always and forever. But, that does, but what that does mean for us is that we have a God 
who cares for us. This is supposed to teach us about our everlasting God and remind us about Him and His eternity. What is it that we can learn from eternity? One, God eternal means He keeps His promises, doesn't He? As an eternal God who's always been and will always be, He is the only one qualified to guarantee to keep His promises. You and I are limited by circumstance or, as Solomon would write, time and chance sometimes. You and I are limited by this life and the things that can come up. The eternal God, our everlasting God, El Olam, He is not limited by such. And this means His eternity allows for Him to keep any and every promise. The Hebrew writer in Hebrew 6 would start this way and say, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more conventionally to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose his eternal reality. He guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge, fight, uh, fight, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The reality of eternity in our God is that he is not limited like you and I to his promises. When he promises something, he can keep it. His character, his purpose, it is unchangeable, unwavering. It will take place. Eternity in God teaches us that we can rely and trust in him for everything and in everything. The second thing it teaches us is that eternal God means he will never leave us nor forsake us. The Hebrew writer again there in 13 and verse 5 says this, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, notice, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Eternity or everlasting in God means that he has always been, will always be, and, has all, and will always go forward in the future. He will never leave us nor forsake us if we seek righteousness and truth in him. His eternity means that we can rely on him. His knowing the end from the beginning allows him and his eternity to be there with us through everything. Don't get me wrong. We can turn from him and, and leave him. But he's eternal. And if we are faithful and true, his eternity, his everlastingness teaches <coughs> us that he is there. Thirdly, eternity in God teaches us about the eternal rest for the righteous. Jesus would say there in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God teaches us in his eternity, in his existence, that there is that which rests for us and waits for us an eternal rest. He's given us, showed us, and demonstrated that to us. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 would say this, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. It's an rest 
from the dangers, the strickenness, the sin, and all the things that are in this life, eternity in God teaches us and shows us and demands that we can be with him forever. That because he's always been and always will be, that we can trust in that. In Revelation 14, verse 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. God's eternity teaches us about the eternal rest in heaven one day with him. In Hebrews 4, 10 and 11, again we read this. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work, works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. When we look at our everlasting God. When we see God described as such, God put that in there so we see his eternity. And God's eternity demonstrates his trustworthiness. It demonstrates that he will keep his promises, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he will be faithful to the end. And if we are faithful to him, we have a rest in him that is eternal. When we first see there in Genesis 21 and verse 33, El Olam, we see God teaching us that he is a rock in our life and that he is our king and that he is our everything. God everlasting wants you and I to trust and obey him so that we can spend an eternity with him. El Olam wants you and me. He wants us with him forever. But as we know throughout the scriptures, it's based on whether or not we've obeyed the gospel and whether or not we are willing to Fight that good fight of faith here in this life. When we think of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he has set forth that which is necessary to know and to be a part of, which will help us have a relationship with him again. When we get into his word and grow in our faith with him, when we learn who he is and who we are and the need to repent, because of the sins our God, our Savior, died for. When we confess him as Lord and obey his holy message, his good news, that we too can be saved, then we can be a part of his family. As Jesus in Acts 2.47 added to the church, we too can be. And if we are willing to live that faithful life, we talked about this morning, we will be filled with that festal joy, or shout, excuse me, that joyful shout, in other words. This evening, as you reflect upon that, don't let any sin in your life hinder you from eternity with God. Don't allow anything in this world to keep you from obeying your everlasting God and being with him for eternity. If you need the prayers of this congregation, if you need our love tonight, let us help you. Let us pray with you. Let us encourage you. Let us get into his word with you. Let us help you. Increase in your relationship with him. Tonight, if there's someone who needs the church, come forward now and let us know as we stand and as we sing.